One of the points that we make in the book, as I mentioned earlier, is that being less bad is not being good, it's being bad but less so. And part of the problem with that is that if I found myself going north uh, to, uh, to Scandinavia, when I'm supposed to be going south to Africa, I, it doesn't help me to slow down unless I'm turning around. I'm going in the wrong direction. And what we need is a new direction, and that direction is toward more good instead of less bad. And so we use the cherry tree as, a, as, a, as an inspiration, and we realize that the cherry tree, every spring, we look at the cherry tree and we say, isn't it wonderful how many things that it can do uh, as it celebrates its own abundance of cherry blossoms, but it's not very efficient because it takes thousands of cherry blossoms to make one more tree. But we love the, its effectiveness. We, we delight in its delightfulness. And so uh, we are looking at the world and thinking how wonderful it would be if we could design things as human beings where we celebrate the abundance of human design instead of worry about the fact that we have conspicuous consumption and we're destroying the planet as we celebrate uh, of various kinds of commercial abundance. So what would it mean for growth to be good? What if growth was good? Well, it would need then to follow nature's laws because if you ask a child what it's like to grow, a child would have to say it's growth is good. They watch themselves grow up, they watch a tree grow, growth is good. But when we grow a tree or a child, that's good. But if we grow asphalt or tar or, or impervious surfaces and so on, we have to ask ourselves, is that good? So being in a science museum, uh, I thought it'd be good to look at E equals MC squared as a poem for designers. I'm not a scientist, but I, I can do the mathematics. If C is a very big number, which is, it is, 186,000 miles per second, and we square it, it's almost infinite, which means that if M is in any way a positive, then E is almost infinite. And this is why Hiroshima and Nagasaki disappeared, because a very small amount of M can yield a very large amount of E. But if we use this as a poem, what we realize is that E is really physics and the sun. It's this nuclear reactor that we have. It's 93 million miles away. It's eight minutes, and it's wireless. What is our problem? In eight minutes, we get thousands of times more energy than we need to operate human systems. And yet, we insist on burning ancient sunlight and causing climate change. So I think we will solve the energy problem because we have the physics of the sun. We have our nuclear reactor exactly where we need it, uh, eight minutes away. What I think we won't solve if we're not careful is the mass problem, the other part of Einstein's equation, which is, the, is chemistry. And so the sun, in a poetic way, shines on the Earth's surface, which is inorganic chemistry, and we get what Einstein didn't deal with, which is biology. And so the world is really meant to be growing, biota. That's the, the, the system. The system is the sun shines on inorganic chemistry, we add water, and we get biology, and we're supposed to be getting more and more biology. So we need to celebrate that design. But when we look at the mass, we realize too that we can't just take all the chromium out of South Africa and put it in our products and put it in holes in the ground as we destroy the planet's quality with toxic materials, because future generations will look back and say, what were you thinking? You took all these valuable technical nutrients and used them to toxify us when you could have been using them in products that were infinitely reusable where we could get access to this material safely. So we look at biology and then recognize that the second amazing discovery of the last century was DNA. And when you look at Francis Crick for nine years after discovering DNA with James Watson, looked at what he called the nature of vitalism, what it meant for something to be a living thing. His conclusion is, order, in order to be alive, you have to have growth, you have to have free energy from sunlight, and an open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism and its reproduction. Growth, free energy from sunlight, and an open metabolism. Well, I think we can all understand now growth as being essential for life. We can understand that we need to use the energy from the sun to support that growth as income to have growth, we need income, that comes from the sun. 
and we need an open metabolism. What is this open metabolism of chemicals? So if we could design a system that allowed us to celebrate growth, then the question would no longer be growth or no growth. It would be what do we want to grow? And we could choose to grow positive things instead of watch our designs prove all these negative things that we worry about. We could, we could focus on the things that we want to grow. Prosperity, health, security, community, peace, culture, and so on. And we would need a strategy to help us get to that target. And we would have to define the target so that we can reach toward it. And so what we need is a flight path. We've developed a tool working with the Department of Defense in the United States to understand how to solar power the military in the United States, which sounds ironic, but if you think about it, it's the largest single user of energy in the world, is the U.S. military. Imagine. So if you look at what it means to have optimized sustainability, we could then say, what would it take to be 100% sustainable? And you could pick anything. If you pick renewable energy, for example, you could say, what does it mean to be 100% renewable? Then you recognize that efficiency is very helpful because with efficiency, we can reduce our demand very quickly. The problem with efficiency is when you try and use it to solve your problem ultimately because being efficient is not necessarily being effective. This is a really important distinction. Peter Drucker, the management consultant, pointed out that it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way, but it's an executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. Because you could be a very efficient manager doing the wrong thing, right? An efficient Nazi is worse than an inefficient Nazi, right? So is efficiency a good? Well, it has no value. It depends on what you're doing. But effectiveness really matters. If effectiveness is the question of what are you doing? Are you doing the right thing first? Then let's do it efficiently. So the first question becomes, let's be very efficient with our energy, but recognize that that's insufficient to our goal of 100% renewable, because we still then are using fossil fuels, and we're still using nuclear power, and so on and so forth. So just being efficient won't solve our problem. We need to have a new design paradigm. And that's what's really represented uh, as leadership, is the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. So what is eco-effective design? Well, we use three design principles. Waste equals food, use current solar income, and celebrate diversity. And if we use those three principles in our design, we find interesting things start to happen. And I'll show you first what happens at the molecular level, and then we'll, we'll talk about what happens at the level of a building or a region. Well, this open metabolism of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organism that Francis Crick talked about, can be broken into two metabolisms, that of the biological type and that of the technical type. And so we, we see that we can design things like textiles that aren't going to be recycled as technical material, but are going to go back to soil, either in a landfill or, or, or back to compost to generate living soils that we use for human purposes or for natural restorations. And so we design things like textiles to be totally safe and able to go back to technical, uh, to biological cycles. Um, other materials like this computer or a car or a plastic carpet and things like that would be designed as technical nutrients in the technical metabolism. So we have two types of nutrients. And we see everything as nutrition uh, rather than as waste. We eliminate the concept of waste. So things are either designed to go back to biological cycles or back to technical cycles. Now, a product in a technical cycle we call a product of service. What you want is the service of the product, not necessarily the ownership of the molecules. So I want the service of this computer. I don't need the ownership of the molecules. It doesn't excite me to be the owner of these molecules. Wouldn't it be marvelous if this computer was designed to go back to the company from which it came or another company to become new materials for new products safely in the future. And that's the technical nutrient strategy. 